Hello, my name is Jason Gottlieb. I'm Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Division of Hematology at Stanford Cancer Center and the Stanford School of Medicine. It's my pleasure to introduce this webinar on eosinophilic disorders, classification, diagnosis, and treatment. I will proceed with part one of this webinar and I will be followed by Dr. Serge Verstovsek from the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. By way of introduction to eosinophilic disorders, I'd like to discuss uh, some background on the eosinophil as shown on this slide. Of historical interest, the eosinophil was histopathologically characterized in 1879 by Dr. Paul Ehrlich who mastered the use of aniline dyes to distinguish cell types. The term eosinophil was born from the observation that the acidic dye eosin reacted strongly with the abundance of highly basic proteins found within the granules of these cells. Eosinophils serve a central function in the host defense against helminth or parasitic infections and undergo recruitment and activation in allergic and inflammatory responses. However, as part of the immune system's effort to maintain normal functioning or homeostasis, the potential for collateral damage by eosinophils exists. Again, as shown in this slide, the normal peripheral blood eosinophil count reflects a balance between malproduction, tissue migration, and death by apoptosis or natural death of cells. An increase in blood or tissue eosinophils is mediated by cytokines or growth factors which are derived from CD4 positive T lymphocytes or T cells in response to many conditions including infections, inflammation, and allergy for example. They are so-called type 1 helper T cells that produce interleukin 2 and interferon gamma, whereas type 2 helper T cells produce growth factors or cytokines such as interleukin 4 and interleukin 5. And interleukin 5 in particular is the most important eosinophil differentiation in growth and survival factor. Both T cell subsets produce the eosinophilic cytokines interleukin 3 and GMCSF or granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor. Eosinophil infiltration and elaboration of toxic protein substances, including major basic protein and eosinophil cationic protein, can lead to organ damage. As shown on the next slide, the upper limit of normal for the range of percent eosinophils in the peripheral blood is approximately 3 to 5 percent with a corresponding absolute eosinophil count of about 350 to 500 per cubic millimeter or microliter of blood. Now the severity of hypereosinophilia has been arbitrarily divided into mild that is an eosinophil count ranging from approximately 500 to 1500 per cumul milliliter of blood to moderate where the absolute eosinophil count ranges from 1500 to 5000 and severe where the absolute eosinophil count is above 5000. For subsets of certain eosinophilic diseases the degree of peripheral eosinophilia or increase of the eosinophil count might help narrow the differential diagnosis. For example, among the pulmonary eosinophilic syndromes, peripheral eosinophilia tends to be relatively mild in drug-induced and idiopathic eosinophilic pneumonia, or IEP. In contrast, in patients with chronic IEP or tropical pulmonary eosinophilia, uh, such patients typically have eosinophil counts that are more severely elevated. Although there is not a direct correlation between the degree of elevation of the eosinophil count and clinical symptoms or organ damage per se, 
we as physicians tend to get more concerned about moderate to severe increases in the eosinophil count because in such patients the potential for organ damage and more symptoms exist. The next slide shows how we as physicians may approach the workup of a patient with eosinophilia. Because most cases of eosinophilia are reactive in nature, it makes it even more important to thoroughly investigate secondary causes of high eosinophil counts. It would not be uncommon for a patient presenting with hypersinophilia to be found just on a routine health exam or certainly in some cases patients may have symptoms that prompt a physician to get a CBC which in turn shows elevation of the eosinophil count. Such patients may first be seen by their primary care or family doctor but it is also not uncommon that such patients are seen by a cadre of subspecialists who try to determine the cause of eosinophilia and such subspecialists may include dermatologists, hematologists, or infectious disease physicians. History taking should involve travel history and possible exposure to infectious agents, drug-related causes of eosinophilia, that is, are certain types of medications causing elevations of the eosinophil count, and signs or symptoms suggestive of systemic diseases should also be elicited. At a minimum, evaluation of the stool for ovum parasite should be undertaken and it is not uncommon that serologic or antibody testing for exposure to strongyloides, a helminthic or parasitic infection should also be considered. The remainder of the work will be guided by the specific patient's presentation but may require chest x-rays, cardiac evaluation, and biopsy of organs in certain instances. Some algorithms have incorporated the use of serial or repeated EKGs or, echocardi or echocardiography, such as ultrasounds of the heart. Even in patients who apparently have asymptomatic eosinophilia, since in some cases occult or hidden organ damage may occur. And also in some cases bone marrow biopsy with chromosome analysis and evaluation of T-cell clonality are useful to rule out a bone marrow disorder or T-cell disease. In a later slide I will go into more depth regarding what is meant by T-cell clonality and T-cell or lymphocyte variant hyperesinophilia. This next slide shows the clinical classification of hypersnophilia which I use. There are four categories, primary or clonal hypersnophilia, secondary or reactive eosinophilia, so-called T lymphocyte variant hypersnophilia, and then unknown forms of hypersnophilia or idiopathic hypersnophilia or hypersnophilic syndrome. Reactive or secondary eosinophilia refers to identifiable conditions that mediate cytokine or so-called growth factor driven eosinophilia. I consider such conditions illnesses that affect the body and influence the bone marrow to make more eosinophils but are not derived from the bone marrow itself. In contrast, primary eosinophilia is typically used to denote eosinophilia related to an underlying bone marrow disease. Among the marrow-related eosinophilias, a clonal marker that is a chromosome or genetic abnormality can usually be found in a subset of patients consisting, consistent with an underlying acute or chronic bone marrow disorder. Thirdly, the lymphocyte variant hypersinophilia, which I will again describe in a future slide, refers to a mixture of a clonal a mixture of a clonal reactor process which can lead to an increased eosinophil count. If patients have neither a primary secondary cause of eosinophilia nor the lymphocyte variant, then they are diagnosed with what is referred to as unknown or idiopathic form of hypersinophilia. That is a cause for their increased eosinophil count cannot be determined. 
generically speaking, we use the term idiopathic hypersnophilia to refer to patients who have an elevated eosinophil count but no signs or symptoms of organ damage, but idiopathic hypersnophilic syndrome to refer to those patients who again have an increased eosinophil count but do in fact show signs of organ damage. With regard to the next slide, it's important to keep in perspective the relative contributions or causes of eosinophilia. As a hematologist, certainly uh, I belong to a, a subspecialty which tends to focus on bone marrow derived or primary causes of an elevated eosinophil count. However, the overwhelming majority of patients who present with eosinophilia will likely have a reactive or secondary cause of eosinophilia as represented by the very large circle of patients with eosinophilia shown on this slide. In contrast, the relative proportion of patients who have either a primary or clonal form of eosinophilia as demonstrated by the smaller red circle or lymphocyte variant hypersinophilia as represented by the light blue even yet smaller circle showing T-cell disorder are relatively small in comparison to those patients that likely have reactive causes of their increased eosinophil count. And again, finally, there are those patients for which a cause of eosinophilia cannot be determined. And this, was, and this is represented by the relatively smaller circle, again, of patients with HGS or idiopathic hypersinophilic syndrome. Even with hematology, HGS is considered a relatively uncommon entity. This next slide focuses on patients with eosinophilia that have a primary bone marrow disorder. These patients are referred to as having, again, either a primary eosinophilia or a clonal eosinophilia. And clonality refers to the fact that a cytogenetic or that is chromosome abnormality can be found in the blood or bone marrow or some other genetic or molecular genetic abnormality can be identified. Such primary bone marrow disorders include chronic eosinophilic leukemia, certain subtypes of acute myeloid leukemia or AML and acute lymphocytic leukemia or ALL, chronic myelogenous leukemia or CML, which is characterized by a very specific genetic abnormality called the Philadelphia chromosome or BCR ABLE, myelodysplastic syndrome or MDS, systemic mastocytosis, and then there are a group of diseases characterized by very specific genetic abnormalities such as rearrangement of the gene for fibroblast growth factor receptor 1 or FGFR1 or other chronic myeloproliferative disorders with rearrangements of the genes platelet-derived growth factor receptor alpha or PDGFR-A or platelet-derived growth factor receptor beta or PDGFR-B. And it's important to identify such diseases because they may have very specific or different treatments and they can be often readily identified by performing analyses of the peripheral blood and more importantly the bone marrow. And so a work of these diseases is important if reactive or secondary causes of eosinophilia are excluded. This next slide illustrates reactive or secondary causes of hypersinophilia. And it should be noted that in developing countries, infections likely account for the overwhelming majority of patients who present with hypersinophilia, whereas in developed countries, allergy or hypersensitivity diseases, such as asthma, likely account for the major proportion of patients who present with secondary causes of hypersinophilia. In addition to infections, which may be due to parasites, bacteria, viruses, or fungi, uh, 
in allergy or hypersensitivity diseases such as asthma, rhinitis. There are other conditions which can cause reactive hypersnophilia. These include connective tissue diseases such as shirk strauss syndrome, Wegener's granulomatosis, SLE, which is lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, or other causes. Other pulmonary conditions, which I'll talk about in more detail on a future slide. Cardiac conditions, dermatologic conditions such as atermic dermatitis, urticaria, or eczema. In fact, other malignancies can cause increases in eosinophil count. In such cases, it's believed that the tumor cells, the tumor cells themselves elaborate eosinophilic growth factors that cause more eosinophils to be produced and survive. And such cancers include Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, or cancers of the lung, breast, and kidneys, just as some examples. There are certain GI or gastrointestinal conditions which can not only involve tissue infiltration by eosinophils in the gut, but also be associated with eosinophil elevations in the blood. And this includes eosinophilic gastroenteritis, or for example, celiac disease. And there are some metabolic conditions such as adrenal insufficiency, which refers to the inability of the body to produce sufficient amounts of steroids for normal homeostasis. And there are some other miscellaneous conditions which are quite rare, such as treatment with interleukin-2, or ingestion of L-tryptophan, or so-called toxic oil ingestion, which leads to an isnophilia myalgia syndrome. And then in some patients who have rejection of their renal graft, this can also be associated with isnophilia. So the message of this slide is that it is important to keep an open mind as the evaluating physician to consider all possibilities for eosinophilia before considering primary marrow disorders. And it is my practice to go through this type of list and obtain a thorough history and physical examination to exclude these entities. This next slide refers to a another, albeit uncommon, cause of an elevated eosinophil count, which we refer to as lymphocyte variant hypersnophilia. In the healthy state, the cytokines GMCSF, or granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor, interleukin-3, and again, most notably, interleukin-5, denoted by the abbreviation IL-5, in concert, these cytokines or growth factors direct the proliferation, survival, and differentiation of eosinophils. IL-5 in particular is a very specific eosinophil differentiation factor that is overproduced primarily from CD4 positive T cells or T lymphocytes as part of the immune response leading to hypersnophilia that is observed in parasitic infection and atopy or allergic disorders. Some patients might exhibit expansion of abnormal lymphocyte populations without any other recognized cause of their hypersnophilia. These clonally expanded lymphocytes may be detected by several methods, but in particular flow cytometry or polymerase chain reaction of the blood or bone marrow. So this is a test that can be ordered in the clinical laboratory. However, it should be known that the identification by PCR of a clonal population of T lymphocytes may not be sufficient alone to make this diagnosis. And the diagnostic criteria for this entity has not been fully formed to date. Although it has been found that the T cells in this condition can secrete high levels of interleukin-5, which in turn produces increased eosinophil counts, the serum interleukin-5 
level is not a very sensitive test for this condition and is often normal. So although one can use PCR, flow cytometry, evaluation of the peripheral blood smear, and in some cases one can try to look for elevated levels of serum IL-5 in the blood, again there is not a specific set of criteria with which full confidence one can diagnose the condition. One needs to use all factors together. It should be noted that patients with this condition typically have signs and symptoms of skin disease as a primary skin manifestation. In a very low proportion of patients, uh, there is progression to forms of T-cell lymphoma such as Caesare syndrome. But this is felt to be generally a overwhelmingly benign condition in the vast majority of patients. Treatment with anti-immune drugs to reduce this population of T lymphocytes has been the mainstay of therapy. Such drugs have included prednisone or other steroids and agents such as cyclosporin. On this slide we present the diagnostic criteria of hypersynophilic syndrome. Historically, the term idiopathic hypersynophilic syndrome, or simply hypersynophilic syndrome, has been applied to patients for whom a persistent primary or secondary cause of acquired eosinophilia has not been ascertained. The investigators Hardy and Anderson inaugurated the term hypersynophilic syndrome for such patients in 1968, the first of several modern landmarks in the study of hypersynophilic syndromes. The investigator Chusid and colleagues established its diagnostic criteria in 1975, which are shown here. Persistent eosinophilia of greater than 1,500 or greater for longer than six months. Lack of evidence for reactive eosinophilia. An abnormal T lymphocyte population or clonal or primary bone marrow disorder associated with eosinophilia. And thirdly, signs and symptoms of organ involvement, uh, particularly evidence of organ damage. So ultimately, HES is a diagnosis of exclusion after only aforementioned disorders have been effectively ruled out by an evaluation by physicians. Now, in modern times, it may not be practical to wait six months to establish the diagnostic criteria for these diseases, since today, more expedited workups and more sophistica sophisticated testing can establish diagnosis in an earlier time frame. Sometimes it may be difficult to establish whether a patient has hyper eosinophilic syndrome or HES versus chronic eosinophilic leukemia. Chronic eosinophilic leukemia is actually a primary bone marrow disorder. In fact, what may be helpful in distinguishing CEL from HES is demonstration of increased blasts, that is leukemia cells in the peripheral blood of more than 2% or increased blasts in the bone marrow of more than 5%. In addition, demonstration of a chromosome or other genetic or molecular abnormality in either the bone marrow or blood can be useful for citing that a patient has CEL. In HES, by definition, the patient should not have a primary bone marrow disorder, and therefore there should be no increased blast in the bone marrow or blood, nor the identification of a chromosome or genetic abnormality. This next slide shows that there are two types of clinical presentations of hypersynophilia, or two clusters or two buckets, the so-called lymphocytic and myeloproliferative variants. The lymphocytic variant again relates to T lymphocyte mediated hypersynophilia, 
and as I previously mentioned, is very frequently associated with skin involvement, such as macular or papular rashes, angioedema, urticaria, erythroderma, or vasculitis. These patients often have elevated levels of immunoglobulin E or IgE and interleukin-5, although it can be difficult to find a clinical test that can actually measure elevated levels of serum interleukin-5, as I previously alluded to. And again, these patients are frequently treated with immunosuppressive or anti-immune drugs and over the long term generally have a good prognosis. Patients with the myeloproliferative variant often present with anemia, thrombocytopenia, enlargement of the liver or spleen, or so-called hepatosplenomegaly. That can be detected by physical examination by palpation or by CT or ultrasound imaging. And when one looks at the bone marrow underneath the microscope, one can find in some cases evidence of bone marrow scarring or fibrosis and anomalies in the shapes or appearance of the blood cells which we refer to as dysplasia. In contrast to patients with a lymphocytic variant, these patients at least historically tended to have a worse prognosis and have been more resistant to traditional therapies. Let's talk a little bit or provide more detail about hypersinophilic syndrome. This next slide briefly mentions the epidemiology of the disease. It's of interest that this is a condition which has a striking predisposition for males, but the reason for this is entirely unclear. Most patients present between the ages of 20 to 50, but rare cases in fact have been described in infants and children. The prognosis can be variable, with some patients having indolent disease for years and some patients experiencing death within months, but in most cases these patients present with advanced disease to begin with. This next slide shows data regarding the natural history or prognosis of patients with idiopathic hypersynophilic syndrome or HES. The important point to comment on here is that these data are derived from older studies before the use of imatinib, which has been shown to be an extraordinarily useful drug for a subset of patients with hypersynophilia, that is, those patients with the FIP1L1-platelet-derived GoFactor receptor alpha fusion or FIP1L1 PDGF or alpha fusion. In a review of 57 cases published between 1919 and 1973, the median survival of such patients was nine months. The three-year survival was 12%. CHF, or congestive heart failure, accounted for 65% of deaths at autopsy. And at least in this particular study, factors that portended a worse prognosis included increased blasts in the peripheral blood, and a white blood cell count greater than 100,000. In a later study of 40 patients, the five-year survival was 80%, and 42% of patients were found to be alive at 15 years. And in contrast to the prior study, factors that predicted a worse prognosis in these patients included lack of response to steroids, cardiac disease, male sex, and the height or degree of eosinophilia. Now again, it's worth mentioning that with today's more sophisticated tools in evaluating eosinophilia and the likelihood that there is more rapid attention to the problem of eosinophilia, advances in medical care and in cardiac surgery, it is very likely that these relatively poor survival curves have been dramatically improved in recent years. Having said this, it is hard to come by large studies 
reevaluating survival of patients with eosinophilia or HES in particular in the last 10 to 15 years. This next slide shows the most common presenting signs and symptoms of HES. Most patients present with symptoms, but a little more than 10% will have their eosinophilia discovered incidentally. HES has the potential to affect all organs. Beside eosinophilia, hematologic or blood findings may include neutrophilia or an increase in the neutrophil count, basophilia or an increase in the basophil count, anemia, and either thrombocytosis or thrombocytopenia, that is an elevation or decrease of the platelet count. Increased blasts or leukemia cells and mild fibrosis or scarring of the bone marrow are less common and are more suggestive of chronic eosinophilic leukemia. Morbidity and mortality in this disease has traditionally been most often linked to cardiac involvement and exemplifies some of the mechanisms that contribute to organ damage. In the case of cardiac organ involvement, eosinophil damage to the endocardium is mediated by the contents of the eosinophil granules such as major basic protein and cationic protein. Endothelial damage in the heart leads to the development of local platelet thrombus or clot which can lead to the development of larger clots in the heart that can actually embolize or that has traveled to other parts of the body such as the brain and cause a stroke. Eventually organization of this blood clot within the heart can lead to reaction of scarring within the heart and lead to restriction of the ability of the heart to pump effectively, what we call restrictive cardiomyopathy. In contrast to the frequency of various organ involvement shown here on the slide in HES, a more recent study from the NIH showed that during follow-up of patients with during follow-up of patients with hypersynophilia, dermatologic involvement or that a skin involvement was the most common clinical manifestation reported in 69% of patients, followed by pulmonary involvement in 44% of patients, and gastrointestinal involvement in 38% of patients. Cardiac disease unrelated to hypertension, atherosclerosis, or, rheumat or rheumatic disease was eventually identified in 20% of patients but not only in 6% of patients at the time of initial presentation. This slide shows some common treatment options for idiopathic hypersynophilic syndrome. For patients with mild eosinophilia and no evidence of organ disease, patients are followed serially with a wait and watch approach. With patients who have moderate to severe eosinophilia or evidence of organ damage, treatment with corticosteroids such as prednisone is a typical first-line approach. Resistance to steroids has been found to be a poor prognostic factor in some series. Disease not controlled by steroids is usually managed with the oral chemotherapeutic hydroxyurea or hydrea. In addition, interferon alpha can elicit durable hematologic and actually chromosome responses in some patients with hypersynophilic syndrome. However, it can be a medication that is difficult to tolerate. In patients with more aggressive disease, cytotoxic chemotherapy with some examples shown on this slide and hematopoietic cell transplantation has been used with variable success. In addition, cardiac surgery can extend the life of some patients with HES who have valvular disease or endomyocardial fibrosis. Anticoagulation can benefit some patients who have pre-existing thrombosis. As always, clinical trials are a mainstay of uh, options for patients with hypersynophilia, particularly HES, who have seen some of the aforementioned treatments but have not uh, responded or have relapsed on therapy. Imatinib mesolate, also known by the brand name Glebeck, is a type of drug known as a small molecule inhibitor or tyrosine kinase inhibitor.
It is an oral medication that has shown substantial success in several diseases, most notably b able positive chronic myelogenous leukemia for which it gained approval in 2001. Imatinib also shows success in diseases such as acute lymphocytic leukemia, also because of its target b able In addition, imatinib has shown success in treating gastrointestinal stromal tumors based on inhibition of platelet-derived GOFAD receptor alpha, and in cases of aggressive systemic metacytosis for which the acute mutation status is unknown or wild type. Lastly, imatinib has shown efficacy in treating patients with chronic myeloproliferative disorders who have rearrangement of the gene platelet-derived growth factor receptor beta. The common thread between these diseases is that they have specific protein targets which imatinib can bind to and those cells with those targets undergo death and these diseases are successfully treated because of the abnormal cells are effectively eliminated by this agent. The success of imatinib in chronic myelogenous leukemia led to its empiric use in patients with hypereosinophilia who exhibited signs suggestive of a myeloproliferative disorder. This slide shows that in 2001, Dr. Schaller Birkeland reported a case of a patient who responded to the low dose imatinib with essentially a complete remission of their hypersinophilia that had been previously treated with other drugs without success. This was followed in 2002 by a report by the group from MD Anderson who similarly showed that there is substantial success in a patient with hypersinophilia treated with imatinib. In addition to the case reports uh, shown on the prior slide from Dr. Schaller and Brooklyn and the MD Anderson group, there were publications from the Mayo Clinic and patients being treated at Stanford and the Harvard system that were showing significant responses to imatinib in patients who had eosinophilia but had seen prior agents and had either failed therapy or had relapsed on prior medications. These patients were sending a clear message. The rapid and complete hematologic remissions to imatinib in these patients with hypereosinophilic syndrome implicated a tyrosine kinase in the pathogenesis of the disease. We were in fact witnessing responses similar to those tremendous responses seen in chronic myelogenous leukemia with imatinib. It therefore prompted researchers at Harvard to go back to the bench that is in basic research lab to try to identify the target which explain imatinib success in patients with hyper-eosinophilic syndrome. This next slide shows the New England Journal of Medicine research report which identified the FIP1L1 PDGF for alpha fusion, which was the target of imatinib, and the successful response to imatinib patients with hypersinophilic syndrome. This study was done with clinical samples from patients who responded to imatinib, and this was done through a consolidation of efforts from multiple groups in the United States and Europe, and led by Drs. Gary Gilland and postdoctoral fellow Dr. Jan Kuhls. I'd like to use the next several slides to describe some of the findings of this seminal report. Shown on this slide are photos from a, a patient treated at Stanford who had acute myeloid leukemia arising from prior hyperesinophilic syndrome. In panel A, the marrow biopsy section is hypercellular with scattered eosinophils and columnar arrays of immature white blood cell or myeloid cells. A reticulum stain in panel B highlights severe bone marrow fibrosis. As you can see, after three months of therapy, 
with imantinib, the marrow biopsy in panel C reveals marked hypocellularity without increased immature myeloid cells nor eosinophils. Similarly, in panel D, the reticulin stain shows markedly diminished bone marrow fibrosis consistent with a dramatic response to imantinib therapy. The clinical findings in this next slide corroborate the remarkable bone marrow findings uh, shown on the patient just described. In 16 patients with hyperesinophilic syndrome, the FIP1L1 PDGFR alpha fusion was found in 9 patients. Amongst 12 patients treated in this study, all 6 patients with the fusion responded completely. In addition, there were 4 additional patients who responded partially with improved signs and symptoms of disease who didn't have the fusion. In these patients, the basis for response is not clearly known because the fusion was not detected. The major finding that is major molecular finding in this New England Journal of Medicine study is that the basis for response to imatinib is because of this FIP1L1 PDGFR alpha fusion protein. This fusion gene actually results from the area between them being deleted or missing and the two genes coming together creating a new fusion gene that is responsive to imatinib. In fact, this is not unlike the situation in chronic myelitis leukemia where there is a fusion with BCR gene on chromosome 22 and the ABLE gene on chromosome 9. It just happens to be that in this case, that is in the case of patients with the HES, these two genes are on the same chromosome and come together, whereas in CML, the two genes come together from two different chromosomes. This next slide is actually a pictorial representation of how the FIP1L1 PDGFR alpha fusion gene is created. This highlights a segment of chromosome 4Q12, and you can see in the middle of the slide that there is a deletion between the two genes. This is actually a 800 kilobase deletion, and when this chromosome segment is deleted, the two genes come together, and you can see that uh, this is a fusion gene that, again, is exquisitely sensitive to imatinib, even more so than the fusion gene BCR able in CML. It is worth noting that the FIP1L1 PDG for alpha fusion in patients with hypersynophilia or HES is not visible by standard chromosome analysis. Instead, a technique called fluorescent in situ hybridization or FISH can be used to search for this molecular abnormality. This particular FISH image, again, is from a patient with HES. The green probe 200D9 spends a segment of DNA between the FIP1L1 and PDGR for alpha fusion gene, and PDGR for alpha genes. As you can see, the green light, the green signal lights up on the normal chromosome 4Q12, but on the other chromosome, this chromosome region is deleted. This deletion, in fact, has been used as a surrogate marker for the FIP1L1 PDGR for alpha fusion in patients with hypersynophilia. In a prior slide, I showed you the bone marrow of a patient with HES who had a dramatic response to therapy after several weeks, and that bone marrow was shown after three months of therapy. However, after an additional three months, the patient had a relapse and subsequently expired. Dr. Gary Gilliland's group from Boston obtained samples from this patient at the time of relapse and found a sequence change in codon 674, which is located in the kinase domain of platelet-derived go factor receptor alpha gene. This change, in fact, converts the amino acid from a threonine to an isoleucine, and remarkably is in the exact same position as a threonine to isoleucine 315 mutation in ABL in the BCR-ABL fusion gene in CML. And again, not surprisingly, similar to the 
T315I mutation, this T674I mutation confers resistance to imatinib and explains why that particular patient relapsed on imatinib therapy. This mutation determined at the time of relapse confirmed that the FIP1L1 PDGF4-alpha fusion gene is in fact the target of imatinib in patients with hypersinophilic syndrome. It should also be noted that since this original mutation was identified, there have only been approximately some five other patients in the literature that have been described with resistance mutations, and almost all of them have this particular T674I mutation. There are other agents now available that may be considered to try to overcome this resistance mutation, but it is still difficult to treat. Although the initial New England Journal of Medicine report suggested that some 50% of patients with hyperesinophilic syndrome have the FIP1L1 PDGF or alpha fusion. In fact, several studies since that time suggest that the true incidence of this molecular abnormality is no more than approximately 10%. In this particular study, there were some 740 patients referred for testing of the fusion who had hyperesinophilia, and only 21 patients, or 3%, were found to be positive for the fusion. However, the New England Journal of Medicine report is consistent with this report in that uh, essentially all patients who have the fusion respond to imatinib. The study also showed that in those patients who try to discontinue imatinib, that over time patients do relapse either at a molecular level by using FISH for the CHIC2 deletion or using PCR to detect the FIP1L1 over alpha fusion or frank hematologic relapse. Now with the benefit of time, what have we learned about FIP1L1 PDG for alpha positive patients with hypersnophilia? Again, as previously stated, we believe that only about 10% of patients with hypersinophilia or HES express this fusion. Of interest, the overwhelming majority of patients with this fusion are male for reasons that remain yet unexplained. Also, as stated previously, this is an abnormality that is not detectable by standard chromosome analysis, and in this regard, testing by FISH or PCR is mandatory. Having said this, the overwhelming number of labs, at least in the United States, use FISH instead of PCR, although certain research labs may use either modality. These patients often have an elevated serum tryptase, which is a lab test that can be obtained and is often elevated in patients who have mastocytosis or myeloproliferative features of a hypersinophilia, which was alluded to on a prior slide. In fact, these patients show features of a myeloproliferative disorder. Bone marrows not infrequently show increased fibrosis. Patients may often have increased size of their spleens, and they pre may present with compromise of bone marrow function resulting in anemia and or thrombocytopenia. Unlike treatment of CML with imatinib, which requires a standard starting dose of 400 milligrams daily, this particular disease, a FIP1L1 PDG for alpha positive hypersnophilia, is exquisitely sent to imatinib, and patients can do very well for long periods of time treated with 100 milligrams daily. Then finally, there are only very rare cases of patients exhibiting resistance to imatinib, and such patients often show such resistance in later stages of disease or so-called acute myeloid leukemia phase or blast crisis phase of their chronic hypersinophilia. Now, having given you a summary of some basic features of the diagnosis and classification of eosinophilia and treatment with an emphasis on FIP1L1 PDGF for alpha positive patients with hypersnophilia. It's my pleasure to give this presentation over to Dr. Verstovsek.